Thank you again, Annette. I don't know how many of you have ever done the, uh, what are those NASCAR racing where you get in the car and r r ride around like a r uh, NASCAR driver. I've always wanted to do it, but there's this, the one thing that holds me back, my wife won't let me. Uh, yeah, her, her, you know, her best friend's husband was actually killed in one of those going around on the last lap. It hit the wall. And, and you know, it, there, there are things we all do that kind of are that way, you know. And you, you know, I, like I often tell everybody, I want a, a bigger bass boat, and it don't mean I'll go fast. But I know deep down in my heart that when I catch it flat one morning, I would see how flat out it would go. Because now, Pat, don't look down. You do the same. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, uh, we we all do those things. We all push it to the limit. But how do you deal with that? You know, because those crazy things we do that push to the limit, there is some danger in there, and there is danger that can cause death. Well, you know how we deal with it. We don't think about it. As a matter of fact, I, I heard a, a NASCAR, not a NASCAR driver, but an Indy 500 driver was asked. He, he said, how do you deal with the, the fear that, that at any moment something could happen and you could die? He said, I don't. I just don't think about it. I, I don't. He says, as a matter of fact, if a wreck happens during a race, I don't look at it. I don't watch it on TV. I just, I just put it behind. I, I pretend like it never happened. The Indianapolis International Speedway plays right into this. The, this wonderful pro, uh, denial approach is, you know, if there's a wreck on their track, what they do as soon as the race closes, they send their crew out to paint over the spot where the car hit the wall so there's no evidence left. And, and through all the years of the races that have happened at that raceway, there has never, ever been a driver pronounced dead at the raceway. You can go to the museum that's in the center of the track, at, and there are no memorials to the over 40 drivers who have lost their lives racing there. There's not even a mention of any of them. See, denial is a part of indie racing. And, and I would venture to say that denial is a part of our lives because, because we kind of deny certain things happening. You know, it would never happen to us. And it's prominent in our text for this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Jonah, and you may want to just keep it there, because we're going to use bits and pieces of, of the whole story, and I promise I'm not going to read you all four chapters. I'm going to only read the first three verses of the story of Jonah. Beginning in the first verse of the first chapter, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. You know, if you've read the Bible a lot, you're kind of used to prophets and and responding to God's call this way. You know, but I think Jonah takes it a little bit to the extreme. And, and I really didn't realize distancing, so I started looking at the pieces uh, of the story here. Did you know that Nineveh is only 500-mile journey east of Israel? Now, I know in his time that's a long journey. But instead of going those 500 miles Jonah not only turns a blind eye to God's calling, he turns his back and he goes west as far as he can go to Tarshish, which is 2,500 miles away from his home. And, you know, we laugh at Jonah and we think, what a coward he is. But if you look deeper into the story, I think you may can relate to Jonah. Nineveh actually becomes the capital city of Assyria. You've heard of the Assyrians, haven't you? 
if you've read much of the Old Testament, you yeah. have. As a matter of fact, it was the Assyrians in, in, who came in 720 and, and they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and marched them off into slavery. But you know, the Assyrians were masters in the art of war. And as a matter of fact, they were not only masters in the art of war, they were masters in the torture techniques that they had developed. They made Rome look like kindergartners. You know, when Assyria would come in and they would defeat an army, they would gouge out the eyes of the soldiers that they had defeated and then leave them alive to walk around and wander around in, 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 in darkness. And, and if that wasn't enough, they would fillet some of the soldiers that, were, that they had o overtaken or they would impale them on stakes. They could do all kinds of torture in all kinds of ways to those they had defeated. So here we are. Jonah has been called by God. He says, Jonah, I want you to go to these people. Go to this cruel people who are the master at the art of war, and kings of torture, you've seen how they treat people. Now, Jonah, go into that city and announce my judgment against them because I have seen how wicked these people are. You still don't get it, do you? All right, here's, let's do this. Imagine that God calls you this afternoon. When you get home from church, he don't call you on your cell phone, he, but he calls you. And he says, okay, I'm calling you to go to Iran. So you get on a plane this afternoon and go to Iran, to the largest city in Iran. And I want you to stand in the middle of that city. And I want you to stand up and say, hey, God has sent me here to tell everyone and all of you how wicked you are. And he has seen how wicked you are. And he is going to bring judgment upon you. Now, how do you think it's going to go for you if you do that can you relate to Jonah now are you getting a better picture of what what Jonah is here you know Jonah may have just gone in the other direction because of fear he, he, he may have just started thinking about all the awful things that the citizens of Nineveh could do and, and you know it it may just boil down to common sense but I think deep down in it we all can see that denial that's there, the art of denial. You know, according to my modern psychology, de denial is a defense mechanism that, it, that refuses to acknowledge objective facts and experiences as a way of protecting ourselves from discomfort and anxiety. You know, it reminds me of a story I read this week. It's, it was a, a musical Broadway show called Jumbo with Jimmy Durante in it and, and and during the show he steals an elephant from the circus and, and there's a moment where he's tiptoeing across the stage and and the elephant is, is following behind him as as he's walking across the stage and then out from the other side comes the sheriff and the sheriff stops him and and, and says where are you going with that elephant and Jimmy Durante looks at him in the only way that he could look what elephant but you know how many of us live that way in our families we come together on Thanksgiving or for the holidays and their elephant is in the room the tension between brothers and sisters or between family members or, or the struggles that are there nobody, everybody knows it but nobody mentions it because we're trying to avoid the discomfort and the anxiety. Or, or maybe it's, it's not in your family. Maybe it's at your office. You know, that coworker, the one that rubs everybody wrong, or the coworker that acts this way or that way, and no one will stand up and confront them because they don't want to bring tension and they don't want to live with it. Or, or maybe it's in your neighborhood in the HOA uh, group that there, there's just that one neighbor that just drives everybody crazy, and, but nobody will stand up and, or, Lord, help us. It may even be in the church. 
But what we do, instead of facing the problem, no one mentions it. Because we don't want to deal with anxiety, the pain, the suffering from the issue. So what we do, we are like Jonah. We may not go to Tarshish, but we pick up the rug and we sweep it all under there and allow it to fester. Jane Wagner, who's comedy writer for Lily Tomlin, once said, I made some studies and reality is the leading cause of stress amongst those in touch with it. Then she said, I can take it, reality, in small doses. But as a lifestyle, I found it too confining. It, it was just too needful. It expected me to be there for it all the time. And with all that I have to do, I had to let something go. So what did she do? She let reality go to let go of the stress, the anxiety. She turned a blind eye, and even though she tripped over the elephant, every time she walked across the rug, she denied that it was there. See, I think that's exactly what Jonah is doing in this moment. But I also fear that's what many of us choose to do in our lives is deny and deny and deny because it makes us comfortable. So for all of us, I want you to hear from Jonah, the king of denial, as we look at the rest of his story, because I think in his story he gives us some steps of how to move beyond our denial to the real life God has in store for us. The first step and the first blanks on your outlines are face the truth. You know, the storm is raging. We, 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 you all know the story of Jonah, don't you? You've heard it before, haven't you? Of course, we usually focus on the big fish instead of what's going on. But the storm is raging. Jonah is, is down in the hole of the ship asleep. He is comfortable. He thinks he's got away with it. He, he's, he's got it fine until the captain comes and wakes him and tells him to at least get up and pray. And then, in a panic, they cast lots, and the lot falls upon Jonah. And he responds with these words, I am a Hebrew who worships the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And all of the sailors are terrified because Jonah finally looks at him and says, Throw me in the sea, and it will become calm. I know that this terrible storm is my fault. You know, God uses that storm, that circumstance, to make Jonah look in the mirror and face the truth. It's in that moment he has to face the truth. But doesn't God do the same with us? How many times do we have circumstances that, that kind of get our attention, that turn us around, and that open up? You know, I, I, I told several years ago, I think it was in one of my first churches, there was one of the men in the church that I just, every time he walked in the room, it was like somebody reached over and grated their fingernails on a chalkboard. I mean, I don't know what it was, and I always blamed it on him. But during those three, you know, it's easier to blame it on him and just deny that it's my fault. Uh, during those three years, his wife got sick, and several times we were together, and, and a connection kind of formed. And, and you know what I finally realized in the middle of those circumstances? That I was afraid to face the truth that I was the problem. That it was me who was not wanting to love people the way they are and where they are and for who they are in the middle of that struggle. And, and you know, when I began to face the truth and, 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 and get, get real with it, it, it was in those moments that my eyes began to open. So this morning I ask you, what reality are you avoiding? What truth are you running from? You don't have to say it vocally, but I, there's enough space on the outline where you can write some things down for you. 
See, sometimes we're so worried about what others will think that, that we're af afraid to step forward and to share God's story with them. We, we don't want to move out and, and follow that nudge that God's placed on our lives because we are more comfortable in our denial. So it's time to face the truth. And how do you do it? You know, my first bit of advice is to ask God to reveal it to you. You know, pray. Fall down on your knees and say, Lord, I need your help here. I, I need you to reveal to me what's going on. I need you to show me what the next steps should be. And, and then after you've asked, to read. You know, this book has got a lot of good advice in it. But the problem is, if you don't open it but once a week, and that's just when the preacher says, turn to so-and-so, so-and-so, and read those verses, it won't help. When you spend time reading, your, and, and I know, and, and this happened, I'm sure you've tried to open it up and say, God, I need to answer to this, and you just open it up wherever it falls, that's your answer. Be careful because you may get something you don't want to hear. But we call this the living, breathing Word of God. Why? Because it speaks to us where we are. And, and I found over the years as you're reading as you're doing your normal opening and, and reading through the Scriptures, it's amazing how God almost knows what's going on in your life and begins to reveal things to you, gives you answers, direction, guidance. And then finally, seek is the last point. That means to call a friend a trusted friend, a counselor, a, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, and, and share with them what's going on. You know, one of my best friends in ministry is a Baptist preacher. I don't hold that against him, and he doesn't hold it against me that I'm Methodist. But uh, if, if there's a situation that I really am kind of anxious about or don't know how to handle or, or just maybe struggling with, I know that I can call him and just kind of talk through the problem or through the situation. And, and he'll listen, and, and he won't judge me, but he'll try to give me some insight. And a lot of times he helps me see things I don't see. So, you know, if you're in that moment and you're afraid to face the truth, try those three steps. Ask, read, seek. And, and, and when you start to face the truth, then comes the next part. The next step is confess our shortcomings. It probably would have been better if I had said confess our sins. Because listen, I just read it to you at the end of verse 12. I want you to hear it again. I know, this is Jonah speaking, that this terrible storm is all my fault. Jonah stood right there on, on, the, on, on the deck of that ship and the wind is blowing and the waves are howling and, 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 and there he says in front of God and everybody, I know this is my fault. I have sinned and, and therefore it's all on me. You know, the old Scottish proverb, you've heard it before, confession is good for the soul. You know, healing cannot happen. Hope cannot shine its light into your light if you are living in denial. You know, you can't be afraid of the consequences. Is that what's holding you back? Are you afraid of the consequences of confessing your shortcomings? John gives us some advice in his first letter. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. I want you to hear it. Do you hear that word confess? It's in, it's in the present tense, which means that this is something we must continually do. We need to do that daily. We need to do that diligently. We need to do that definitely. Now, there's some of us who, 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 are, who, who, who don't, don't need 
to ask for forgiveness or don't think we need to ask for forgiveness because we're already forgiven. You know, I mean, Jesus died for our sins, didn't he? So that's determined. But that's not what the Bible says. You know, we often turn it around and think of judicial pardon from a judge uh, and, and parental forgiveness from a father. And, and, you know, in one sense, Jesus did die for our sins, and, and, and it is singular, but it is plural that John uses here. You know, I know that I'm the only one when I became a Christian, I became perfect. But the truth of it is none of us, when you became a Christian, became perfect, did you? I'm still a sinner, and I'm still in need of God's grace every day. And I'm only where I am by the grace of God. So I continually need to struggle with that aspect of, of confessing my, my sins so that God can continue to forgive me. See, so many of us live in the defeat of holding on that we don't know how to deal with sin in our lives. The only way to deal with sin is to be honest with God. You know, and I wanted to use that scripture Mark quoted to you last week, but he beat me to it, uh, that, that we approach the throne of grace with boldness. But I said, better not use it since y'all think I copied his sermon. But, uh, but that's what it's about. The worst sin the only thing we cannot be forgiven for are sins that are unconfessed. It's recognizing that sin is a powerful thing. And it's admitting to God that we are sinners. That we fall short of His glory. See, I think we've bought into the trap that we've seen in our leaders in this country and our polit pol politicians our politicians don't sin. They may make a mistake. They may get confused. They, they may make a bad choice. They may make an error. But none of them have ever committed a sin. As a matter of fact, most of them will tell you they've never been wrong. And, and we've kind of bought into that aspect of, of using those words. But you can't make a mistake here. Sin is not weakness. It's not an error. Sin is sin. Sin is so bad that when Jesus was on the cross and our sins were brought upon him, God had to turn his back on his very own son. It, it's, it's what separates us from the holiness of God. So it's in those moments that we've got to confess those sins and take them seriously so that we can be forgiven. But hear the good news. You don't have to worry about what everybody else thinks about you because we're all sinners. You know, David figured it out. In Psalm 51, I love this. He said, for I was born a sinner. When I read that this week, I said, amen, David. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. See, David got it. He was never hesitant to go to God with his sins because he knew that everybody else was, doing, was sinning as well. So why not be honest with God and come? And you know, that leads us to the last step. That last point is rely on God's mercy. I had never even thought of it in this light till this week. When Jonah stood there on the deck of the ship and he told them to throw him overboard, I always thought he was just giving in, saying it'd just be better to be dead than have to go to Nineveh. But then, the, and I can't even remember which article I was reading said, you know, it was in that moment that Jonah turned around and he relied on God's grace. He relied on God's mercy. Jonah had already confessed his sin, and then he said, okay, y'all throw me in the sea and this will stop and I'll save you, and God will save me. And what happened? 
Now, this is the part of the story you know. Jonah's in the sea. He begins to sink, and God sends a big fish, and, and the fish swallows Jonah. And for three days, and for three nights, I've heard that number somewhere before. It sounds familiar. How about you? And, and, and it's in that moment, in the belly of the fish, that Jonah came face to face with God. And he cried out for his salvation. And then God caused that fish to vomit Jonah on dry land, ground. That's in the Bible. I didn't say that because I may get in trouble later for using that word in the pulpit. And when Jonah in that moment was on dry land, all of a sudden he turned around and he quit running. He quit living in denial, and he left and went forward, willing to face the consequences of the moment. And he went into Nineveh, to the very center of the city, and he stood before those people, and he said, Hey, get this, you are wicked people. God sent me here to bring judgment upon you. What a moment. Because in that moment, Jonah knew that it didn't matter what they did. God had his back. And God's mercy was afresh every moment. You know, what could happen if we moved out of denial? If we faced the truth, if we confessed our sins, and if we truly relied on the mercy of God, how would things be different? You know, it, the church, how many of you know John 3.16 by heart? God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have eternal life. We all know it by heart, but how many live like that is true every day? Because you know what that means? That's really saying, God, I'm going forward every day knowing that your mercy, you've got this. It doesn't matter what life throws at me. It doesn't matter how uncomfortable it gets. Guess what? I'm relying on your mercy. James Moore tells a story, and I think all us preachers have used it. You've heard it before, of about a preacher who one night had a dream that he had died and gone to heaven. He reported to the pearly gates, and he was met by St. Peter. St. Peter said, well, it's going to take 100 points for you to get in. And he said, the pastor just poked out his chest and said, well, I've been a pastor for 43 years. And Peter said, well, that's great and wonderful. You've been a pastor for how many years? 43. Peter said, that's one point. He said, one point. He said, well, now, wait a minute. He said, I tell you what, I visited the sick and the shut-ins. He said, well, that's another point. So that's two. You need 98 more. Peter said, well... The, the preacher said, well, you remember that summer that I didn't have a youth pastor? I spent the whole summer with the kids, with the youth. Peter said, you did with the youth? He said, yeah. He said, that's another point. Still on 97. And the preacher looked at him and said, what else? Could he said, well, you know, I started a new service one time, and we had 100 people coming to it. When I he said, that's another point. You got 96 more. Finally, the preacher fell on his knee and said, Lord, have mercy and Peter said, that's 96. You know, when we fall into the hands of God and fall in, rely on His mercy, that's when we've got it. I don't know where you are. I don't know if you're living in denial. But you know, maybe this challenge is for us to face the truth, to confess our shortcomings, and then to step out into the mercy of God. It's easy. All you got to say is, Lord, here I am. I'm a sinner. And Lord, I am in need of your grace, so forgive me for my sins. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. It's that simple. Pray that prayer. 
This altar is open for you to come pray that prayer. It's open for you to come pray any prayer. As Ronnie leads us in our closing hymn, you know, and I invite you this morning to come pray that prayer. If, you, if you're not comfortable coming to the altar and praying that prayer, hey, pray it where you're sitting in your seat. But let me know when you walk out the back door. 